This week, the gospel comes to us from Mark, chapter 7, verses 1 through 15. Now, when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything that comes from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he said to them, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and whoever speaks evil of father or mother must surely die. But you say that if anyone tells father or mother, whatever support you may have had from me is korban, that is, an offering to God. Then you no longer permit doing anything for a father or mother, thus making void the word of God through your tradition that you've handed on. And you do many things like this. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile. But the things that come out are what defile. Here ends the reading. In the setting where Jesus was teaching, in the whole situation where he was living with his first disciples. The preparation and consumption of food had religious overtones that we in our microwave kitchens barely comprehend. Yes, for us, we know that some Jews keep kosher and we know that some Muslims eat only halal food, and that some Hindus and some Seventh-day Adventists are vegetarians. But what somebody else cooks and what somebody else eats, it really doesn't affect us that deeply when we're not that person. It doesn't change how we see them. It doesn't lead us to judge them as people. Or does it? There are situations where not only do we do that, but we're explicitly invited to do that. A good example. I don't know if you ever watch uh, cooking shows. I like them, I enjoy them in very small servings, let me put it that way. Uh, it started for me when I saw my first episode of Iron Chef. And I looked at it, and I was convinced 
for the first few minutes, and maybe I was right when I look back on it, that what I was watching wasn't really a cooking show so much as it was a parody of kung fu movies, only it used a kitchen instead of a martial arts studio. And uh, it used cooking instead of uh, jujitsu or something like that. And instead of a figure sort of distant overlooking the entire story, the, the hidden dragon fighter or the ancient wizard of the mountain was up on top of the kitchen arena, was, was the master chef whoever. And all the less skilled but nevertheless aspiring devotees fighting it out down there on the floor for his approval. Over time, I came to catch an episode of that show that seemed less tongue in cheek about the whole thing. And somehow it seemed like there was more at stake for the contestants. And I would watch another kind of cooking show every so often. And, and I found in many of these shows, and also in recipes that you can find online at the start of the recipe, there will often be, uh, whether from the contestant or from the writer, an autobiographical section that talks about the food that they make. And as often as not, they will start telling you whether you want to know or not about how this potato salad tugs at their heartstrings or this pasta sauce helps their soul to reconnect with some experience usually involving a beloved relative of some sort. And that maybe isn't as far-fetched as it seems. Next week, the uh, Lydia Circle, which is one of our, our women's groups, is going to be holding a bake sale. And I'm going to try to make uh, something from a recipe that uh, always made my aunt a little bit mad. And the reason she got mad about it was that she and my mother had the same recipe, but my mother, when she made it, uh, it always turned out a whole lot better. And I don't know what it was, but it did. I'll just leave it at that. And I, I will say that she got mad about it. And, and the part that she didn't see was my mother, when she made it, would be anxious about it. This got under both of their skins and for the same reason which was that neither of them wanted to admit that my mother was the better baker of the two of them and that their mother, my grandmother, knew it and would say it. Now, that isn't to say the rest of the family didn't also know that. Uh, to this very day, even now, uh, in the family, we all occasionally make jokes about my aunt's pie crust. Now, I am joking when I say that when Jesus said there's nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile, he never had to choke down one of her pie crusts. They were that bad. And to get back to Jesus, because this is about him, not about my aunt's cooking abilities. Jesus knew that people's diet 
sometimes says something about what is going on inside of them. And part of the problem he had with the people that were criticizing his disciples and others who didn't observe each one of the dietary rules as closely as might have been expected of them was because he knew that these things needed to be handled carefully. Now, not for everyone, maybe, but definitely for some people. There was a man named Walter Weingerin, a great preacher, a great writer, who wrote uh, an, a meditation with a very, very interesting title. It's in his book, Ragman and Other Cries of Faith. And uh, this is part of an essay that he wrote, a sermon, a meditation, call it what you will, called, To a Lady with Whom I've Been Intimate, Whose Name I Do Not Know. Now, if that doesn't get your attention, then you have no ear for titles. Um, let me read what he, he wrote. You. I saw you in the great Scott supermarket tonight, and now I can't sleep on account of you, thinking that perhaps you're not sleeping either. Ah, you. You count your coins with bitten nails, not once, but again and again. This is the way you avoid the checker's eyes, as though ashamed of the goods that you buy, as though they declare your loneliness at midnight. Two six-packs of tab, because your buttocks sheathed in shorts are enormous and hump up your back as you shift your weight from foot to foot. You sigh. I think that you do not know how deeply you sigh, nor yet that I'm behind you in line. Four frozen dinners whose cartons assure you that there is an apple dessert inside. Swiss steak, roast beef and gravy, chicken drumsticks, shrimp. Which one will you save for Sunday dinner? Do you dress up for Sunday dinner? Do you set the table neatly when the dinner thaws? Or do you eat alone, frowning? Liquid breakfasts, a carton of Marlboros, five Hershey bars, Tampax, vitamins with iron, a People magazine, aids to fight an appetite, two large bags of potato chips. At the very last minute, you toss a Harlequin paperback on the counter. Is this what you read at Sunday dinner? Is this your company? What private wars are raged between your kitchen and your bathroom? Here I see an arsenal for both sides. The she who would lose weight against the she who asks why and so what? The she whose desires are fed too much, even while they are hardly fed at all. It's your own fault, the first accuses. Two tons were never tons of love. But the other cries, if I were loved, I wouldn't need to eat. Ah, you. Rubber thongs on your feet. The polish on your toenails has grown a quarter inch above the cuticle. I noticed this because when the checker rings your bill, you drop a quarter, which rolls behind me in line. I stoop to pick it up. And when I rise, your hand is already out and you are saying thanks, even before I returned it to you. But then I do a foolish thing. Suddenly, for which... I now ask your forgiveness. I didn't know how dreadfully it would complicate your night. 
I hold the quarter for an instant in my hand. I look you in the eyes, gray eyes of an honest charcoal emotion. And I say, hello. And I say, how are you? I truly meant that question. I'm sorry. Shock hit your face. For one second, you search my eyes, your cheeks slacken, then as though they lost their restraint and might cry. That frightens me. What will I do if you cry? <laughs> but then your lips curl inward, your nostrils flare, the gray eyes flash, and all at once, you are very, very angry. Wangarin knew. More importantly, Jesus knew that not everything that goes into us is food. Food is just one part of what we consume and make a part of us. You have to add to that other things, words, images. We take into us and make part of us things like expectations and hopes, promises made and kept, promises made and broken. It's a mishmash. Not every lesson that we learn and take in is a true lesson. Not every story that we hear and take in is a true story. There's encouragement and there's disparagement. And they both travel the same path into the human heart. These and so many other things go into making up a person. And sometimes it's good. And sometimes it's not. But what transmit, transmutes the bad stuff, <laughs> and there is a lot of it, what has to change it, and can and does, is the word of God's grace. What allows somebody to sort through it all and to filter the harmful from the helpful is that probing word of God himself. That moment when it feels like God is staring straight into your eyes and saying, how are you? And you look back and you know full well, he already knows but maybe just wants to hear it or wants us to hear it from our own mouths so that he in turn can engage us in that life-giving moment of truth. That life-giving moment when God himself is able to speak to us so that we hear his love. To declare that word for us that says, what matters isn't all that other stuff. What matters isn't what was in the past. What is what you may have heard, what you may have been told, what you may have read. What matters is what comes from God. The word of life, the word of Jesus. The gospel tells us how Jesus called the crowd again and said to them, 
Listen. Listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile. But the things that come out are what defile. He would go on to say, for it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Listen. Watch what you eat. Don't overdo it on the ding-dongs. And if your doctor tells you to lose weight, do your best. While we're on that kind of subject, if somebody asks you about your alcohol use, take the hint and get some help. By the time somebody is asking you that question, they have reason to believe there might be a problem. And the same applies to other substances. Get help. If somebody asks you about it, get help. It's out there. There's no shame in having a problem. But it still is a problem. But for every one of us, whether we're talking about food or whether we're talking about something else, What matters is what we put out into the world more than what we take in. What we put out into the world that may be a problem for us, but it may also be a problem for others as well as ourselves. And there's help for that too. And it's in Jesus. Who loves us and tells us so. Amen. Thank you.